Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com. Today we're going to be taking a look at a beautiful three-rail O-scale European steam engine from MTH. This is the French EST Era 2 Class 241A steam engine. MTH first made the 241A available in their 2010 Volume 1 catalog, and they've made it available in a couple catalogs since then. Now, I finally picked this one up in early 2012, and i got to say, I am very impressed. MTH has done an outstanding job with these European steam engines. The detail and the sound effects on this engine are absolutely amazing, and I am really glad that I've finally taken the plunge into some of MTH's European offerings. Now, if you've watched my videos before, you probably know that my layout is modeled on American railroading. So you may be wondering why on earth I would get a European steam engine to run on my layout. That just doesn't fit in. Well, I've said this before, but one of the things that I like about model railroading is that you don't necessarily have to obey the rules of the real world. You can do what you want to do because it's your little world. It's your layout. And that's what I've done here. I didn't get this model because it fits into what I'm doing from a prototypical standpoint. I got it because it's beautiful and because it's unlike anything else I have in my collection. MTH is just making too many beautiful European O-scale trains right now for me to just turn my back on. And so I got this because it's beautiful and because it's different and because it's just a lot of fun to run. Now, as much as I love this engine, I'm the first to admit that I am in no way an expert on European railroading. I am learning, but there's an awful lot I don't know, and so for that reason, I'm going to keep the historical and technical information to a minimum during this review, because, quite frankly, I don't want to come off sounding like an idiot. But for those of you who are experts in European railroading, if you hear me mess up somewhere or I use the wrong terminology, go easy on me because I'm new to this. I really don't know a lot about European railroading. I bought this engine for its aesthetic value, not for any historical or technical reasons. And that's the angle I'm going to come at in this review. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start things off by going over some historical and technical information on these engines, the little bit that I do know. As I said, this is a French steam engine. The road name right here is EST, which was essentially the Eastern Railway of France, up until 1938 at least, when the five main railroads were united under a state railway system called SCNF, which is still around today. So this being an EST engine, it would have been made before 1938. And in fact, the builder's plates on this engine, which are legible, say 1931. This engine is classified as a 241A. That 241 refers to the wheel arrangement. Now, unlike the American system where they count the number of wheels, in the European system they count the number of axles. So, if this were an American steam engine, they would have called it a 482, but being a French steam engine, they called it a 241, because you've got two axles up here, four drive axles, and then one axle back here. The 241A was a compound steam engine, which meant that it actually used the steam twice. It would first be used out here in the high pressure cylinders, and then it would pass into the inside of the engine and be used in the low pressure cylinders, and that would increase the power of the engine. Now what's cool is that when I turn this engine over in a few minutes to show you the underside, you'll see where MTH has actually installed additional drive gear for those inner low pressure cylinders. It's pretty neat. Okay, so now that I've given you some basic information on the real 241As, let's go over some stats and info on this model. And because MTH is trying to sell these to both the European and North American markets, I'm going to give you some of these numbers in both metric and English formats. The length of the engine is right around 24 and a half inches or just over 62 centimeters. The combined weight of the engine and the tender is 9 pounds 14 ounces, or right around 4.5 kilograms. The engine has pretty good pulling power, right around 2 pounds, or just under 1 kilogram. The minimum curve needed to run this engine on 3-rail track is 054. If you're going to run this engine on 2-rail track, you need at least a 42-inch radius. This model features all die-cast metal construction, just like you would expect on any high-end O-scale steam engine. It's powered by one large flywheel motor. It features MTH's Protosound 3.0 along with MTH's digital command system, and it also has a DCC receiver on board as well. Just like all MTH Premier Line engines, there are two versions of this engine available. There's a high rail version that is designed to run on three rail O scale track like you see here, and there's a scale wheeled version that is configured to run on two rail O scale track. But regardless of whether you buy the scale wheeled version or the high rail wheeled version, they are both going to be protoscale 3.2 compatible. And that means that the two rail version can be converted over to three rail operation. 
and the three rail version like you see here can be converted over to two rail operation. If you want to know what I'm talking about, check out episode 13 of my video train blog series. In that episode, I take a scale wheeled MTH gen set switcher and I convert it over to three rail operation. If you've never seen it before, check it out. It's pretty neat. It's just one of the many features of these MTH premier line engines that makes them so versatile. Okay, so now that we've got some of the basic information out of the way, let's go ahead and start taking a closer look at some of the wonderful details and features of this engine. Here's a look at the pilot on this engine, and as you can see, it's very nicely done. Now, for those of you who are into American railroading, you'll notice that they do not use the automatic Janey couplers like we do here in the States. They use what is called the buffer and chain system, and it consists of two buffers, which are basically spring-loaded bumpers, and then a series of chains here in the middle that are used to couple the cars together. And then on the car or engine that you're coupling to, you would have the exact same setup. And the way it works is that you've got a hook right here, and then the railroad employee would come here and pick up this chain and latch it around the hook on the adjoining car or engine. And then, using this turnbuckle device, he would tighten the chain and draw the cars or engines together. And then, on either side, you've got a safety chain, and these are used as emergency chains in case the main chain was to fail for some reason. And that's the way it worked. And pretty much, that's the system they still use today. They've made a few improvements over the years in the buffer design and the chain design, but by and large, this is what they still use today. MTH did a fantastic job with the detail on this buffer and chain system. It's all separately applied, and they've even got a little air hose over here for the air brake system. Now, it should be noted that this is a functional buffer and chain system. It's not just decorative, so if you're really into European railroading, and you want to use the buffer and chain system to couple your engines and cars together, you can do that with this engine because this actually works. But the downside of that for us American O-scalers is that you cannot attach a dummy O-gauge coupler to easily double-head the engines. If you want to double-head these engines, you're going to have to use the buffer and chain system. However, on the back of the engine, it's a different story. You can use one of several different coupling systems on the back of the engine, but we'll take a closer look at that when we look at the tender in a few minutes. Right above the pilot, we've got a nicely detailed LED headlight. Now, as many of you probably already know, the headlights and taillights on European locomotives function differently from those on American locomotives. And depending on the country and the time period that you're modeling, the headlights can be in different locations, different configurations. They can even be different colors depending on what the engine is doing. But on this particular locomotive, there's a single headlight right here on the front of the engine. Here on the underside of the engine, there's lots of wonderful detailing all over the place. There's some nice brass detailing back here, really fine detailing up above the cylinders. The lead truck, the drivers, and the trailing truck all have spoked wheels. The drive gear here is really well done, and as you can see, when the engine is moving, it looks really nice. Here's a look at the front of the boiler, and as you can see, it's very nicely done. There's nice detail all over the place. The front of the boiler does not swing open, for those of you who are going to ask. There are two smoke deflectors, one on either side of the boiler. When you first take the engine out of the box, these will not be attached to the engine. They're packaged separately, and then using a couple screws and some clips, you attach them to the engine once you've got it out of the box. The sides of the boiler are some of the most detailed spots on the engine. You've got loads of separately applied details all over the place, like this ladder and lots of pipes and valves and handrails. And you've even got some nice cast-in details like these steps. And then you've got these beautiful red and gold bands on the boiler. And on the walkway, you've even got some rivet detail down there. And as you can see, on the other side of the boiler, it's just as nicely done. Up on top of the engine, we've got our smokestack, and it has an operating smoke unit inside. And as is typical for MTH smoke units, it puts out a lot of smoke. To fill the smoke unit, of course, you just pour smoke fluid right down the stack. Moving past the smokestack, we've got lots of wonderful detail going all the way back to the cab. Right here is something I want to show you real quick. This piece pops off like that. It's held down by a magnet. And underneath, you won't find any sort of controls or anything what you'll find is a screw. And that screw has to come out if for any reason you need to take the shell off of the engine for maintenance. You'll have to take a couple other screws out of the bottom, but this top screw has to come out as well. But fortunately, MTH has hidden it underneath this dome, and then they've concealed the access point with this nice little cap that goes on. Now we come to the cab. On the top of the cab, we've got nice detailing. There are three roof vents. These two up here open up like that. And then there's one back here that opens up like that. 
The sides of the cab look great as well. We've got nice paint detail, legible builder's plates, plastic inserts in the windows, nice rivet detail, and then all of this nice detail down here, as well as some nice step detail here. I want to take a minute and talk about these valves and pipes that are under the cab. When you first take this engine out of the box, at least the three rail version of this engine, you're going to find this set of valves and pipes already on the engine. However, packaged separately with the engine, you're going to find another set of valves and pipes that looks like this. And the way that it works is that there are a couple of screws under the cab here, and if you undo those screws, you can detach this existing set of valves and pipes and attach this set instead. But the problem is that I'm not totally sure why MTH did this because the instructions don't mention this piece at all. So I'm left with a little bit of a mystery. I'm not sure why MTH put this in the box, but I do have a pretty good guess. My best guess is that MTH is giving you a choice of which set of valves and pipes you want to run with depending on what type of curves you're going to run this engine on. If you remember earlier, I said the minimum curve needed to run this engine is 054. Well, a lot of three railers are going to run it on 054 and some may even push it a little bit and try to run it on 045 or something like that. And the problem is if you run this engine on tight curves, when you go around the curve, if you were to have a bunch of valves and pipes hanging down here, this trailing truck might swing out and hit those valves and pipes and rub up against them, and that would be bad. And so to prevent against that, MTH has attached this abbreviated pipe and valve system so that there's no danger of the trailing truck swinging out and hitting anything. But if you're going to run the engine on wider curves like 072, or if you're going to run this engine as a two-rail model, and two-rail layouts typically have wider curves than three-rail layouts, then you have the option of attaching this more prototypical-looking set of valves and pipes. It hangs down lower, but again, if you're going to run on wider curves, there's no danger of the trailing truck hitting this stuff. And so, if you're going to run it on wider curves, you get a little more prototypical look. And the reason I think this is because MTH has done this before. I've got an MTH Mohawk steam engine, and on the tender, there is a set of pipes that's packaged separately, and you can attach those pipes to the underside of the tender if you're going to run the tender on 072 track or wider. And if you're not, you just leave those pipes off. If you try to put the pipes on and you run the tender on tight curves, the trucks on the tender will rub up against those pipes. And so they give you that option. It's sort of like a reward. If you're going to run the engine on more prototypical wide curves, you get to have a more prototypical look. So that's my best guess as to why there's two sets of piping. The other guess, and I have no idea if this is the case, the only other possibility I see is that perhaps this set of piping represents some modification that was done to these engines at some point in time. But I'm not an expert on the technical specs of these engines, so I don't know about that. But it could be. But my best guess is that they give you the two sets so that if you're going to run it on wider curves, you can have a more prototypical look. Here's a look at the space between the engine and the tender. I think the space between the two is a little unrealistic, but if it's a big issue for you, MTH does make shorter draw bars that you can buy. And if you install one of the shorter draw bars, that will pull the tender to a more realistic distance from the engine. Now, one of the neat things about some of these European steam engines is that they had a completely open cab, and then they had these little gates on the engine and the tender. It's pretty neat. Now let's take a look inside the cab. The inside of the cab is nicely done. You've got hand-painted valves and gauges. There's a light in the cab itself, and there's also a red glow in the firebox when the engine is in operation. You've got two hand-painted crew figures. Now, I don't know if it was like this on the real 241As, but I don't think I'd want to crew one of these things because there's no place to sit, so I'd imagine you'd get pretty tired pretty quickly. Now, my favorite part of the inside of the cab is actually this little bulkhead thing up here. I think it's really stylish and I think it was a really nice touch for MTH to put it there. On the underside of the engine, we've got two center rail pickup rollers, and then we've got traction tires on the rear set of drivers for added pulling power. The last thing I want to show you on this engine is something that I mentioned earlier. If you remember, I said this is a compound steam engine, so it has an inner set of cylinders in addition to the outer set of cylinders. And like I said, MTH added the additional drive gear for those extra cylinders. It was a really nice touch. You can't see it moving because I have to have the engine on the track and moving for this gear to move, but it's pretty cool that they actually put it there. Okay, that's it for the engine. The tender is almost as beautiful as the engine itself, so let's take a closer look. 
The sides of the tender are nicely done. You've got this really nice minimalist logo here. Lots of detail on the underside. Die-cast trucks, of course. And then you've got some nice brass add-on details here. The front of the tender is probably the least decorated section of the tender, but of course it's the part of the tender you see the least of when the engine is running. You've got these nice little doors here that I showed you a minute ago, some cast-in doors here, some nice detail under here, nice rivet and step detail down here, and then a nice little brake wheel up here. The top of the tender is fantastic. You've got a real coal load right here. There's a compartment here and one over here, and both of these open up. Under this one, you'll find the volume control for the engine, and under the other one, you'll find the smoke control for the engine. Moving back, we've got two compartments here. These are just decorative. They don't open. Right here, we've got this nice little fixture with a warning placard on it. Got some nice handrail detail here, and then some lift rings back here. The back of the tender, again, great job. We've got a compartment here that does not open, but it looks really nice. There are two cast-in compartments, one here and one on the other side that you can't see. Those look really nice. We've got two reverse lights that look great. Then we've got two buffers down here and then an MTH protocoupler. Now, as I said earlier in this video, there are several coupling scenarios that you can implement on the back of this engine to fit your needs. If you buy the high rail version of this engine and you're into three rail O scale like I am, out of the box the engine will have this MTH protocoupler on it and you're good to go. If you have the two rail version of this engine, you won't have the protocoupler, but you will have a KD compatible mounting pad underneath right here, and then you can mount up a scale KD coupler. If you want to go the authentic European route, packaged separately with the engine is this assembly. This is a buffer and chain assembly like we have on the front of the engine. You've got the buffers and then the chain right here. And to install it, all you do is remove the MTH protocoupler and this buffer assembly and then replace it with this. The instructions tell you how. Finally, some European modelers, I think especially people in England, like to use what's called the ACE trains coupler. This is what it looks like right here. I've never used anything like this, but if you're the type of modeler that likes to use the ACE trains coupling assembly, there you go. So, like I said, whatever your needs are, there's a coupling setup that you can implement on the back of this engine. Here's a look at the underside of the tender. It's pretty nicely decorated with some nice add-on details here and there, but the best detail, in my opinion, is the floor of the tender. They've actually got it decorated to look like wood planking, which is a really nice touch. You don't see something like that on the underside of a tender very often. The speaker for the sound system is right here. There are two switches, one here and one here. This switch toggles between DCS and DCC operation. This switch toggles between 3-rail and 2-rail operation. One last thing to note is that you'll notice that you don't see any center pickup rollers on the tender. That's because the tender gets its center rail power from the tether coming from the engine. The last thing we're going to do before we start this engine up is BF IMO. Best feature in my opinion. In my opinion, the best feature of this engine is all of the wonderful separately applied detailing applied to the engine. From front to back, this engine is loaded with it. And those of you who have watched my videos for a while know that I'm a big fan of separately applied details. I think it's what separates a toy train from a model train. And this is most definitely a model train. And I don't think I've ever seen a steam engine with this much separately applied detailing. It's amazing. Okay, now comes the fun part. We're going to go ahead and start this engine up and take it for a spin. Now, when I start the engine up, I want you to take note that all of the crew talk dialogue sequences are in French, which is correct, and it's pretty cool that MTH did that. Now, of course, I don't understand about 90% of the French that's being spoken, but it's still pretty cool. So let's go ahead and start it up. I'm going to use the extended startup sequence. It's pretty long, it lasts about a minute and a half, so give it a listen. You'll hear a lot of different sounds. You'll hear coal being shoveled, then you'll hear water being pumped into the boiler, and then you'll even hear a guy coughing towards the end. So it's pretty neat, let's give it a try. There's the sound of the guy shoveling coal. There's some French dialogue. And 
Now you can hear the sound of water. You'll hear a guy cough in just a second, it's pretty funny. There he goes. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and listen to some of the sounds on this engine. The first sound is the whistle. The whistle is by far the best sound on this engine. It's that great high-pitched shrill of a whistle that you may have heard on other European engines before. This is how the whistle sounds if you just press the white whistle button on the DCS remote. Pretty cool. Now, one feature that this engine has is the quillable whistle. So I'm gonna activate that and we'll see how that sounds. Now, I don't think the MTH quillable whistle is near as good as the Lionel quilling whistle. It takes a lot of practice to get pretty good at it, but let's give it a try. Pretty neat. Here's the bell. Now let's hear some of that French crew talk. Pretty cool. Okay, let's go ahead and move it out. Now, ordinarily, you would run this engine with some French passenger cars. I don't have any French passenger cars at the moment. I am planning on getting some in the future, and I'll do a review on those when I get them, but for the time being, I'm just gonna run the engine by itself. Okay, that about wraps it up for this review. As I said, this is an absolutely gorgeous engine, and MTH has done a fantastic job, not just with this engine, but with all of their European steam engines. They are all absolutely breathtaking, and I think you'd be hard-pressed to find any O-scale steam engines that are as wonderfully detailed as these European steam engines that MTH has been putting out. Now, as I said earlier, there are passenger cars that go with this engine. I don't have that passenger car set yet, but as soon as I get it, I will do a review on it and run it with this engine. Now, if you're interested in purchasing this engine, they retail for right at $1,300. Although, if you go through a good MTH dealer, you can probably get a little bit of a discount off that retail price. And, of course, if you're looking for a good MTH dealer, try my favorite train store, which is Legacy Station. You can find them on the web at www.legacystation.com 
or give them a call at 770-339-7780. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time.